Hello, welcome. We'll just wait a few uh, minutes just to get started while we wait for a few people to get online. Fantastic. I can see you all coming in, which is fantastic. Thank you for joining us. All right, I think we're pretty good. Let's um, get started. So good afternoon and welcome to the Australian Stockholm Junior Water Prize finalist presentations. I'm Katie Trevor and I look after the National Awards Program here at the Australian Water Association. I'd like to start today's webinar by acknowledging the traditional inhabitants of the land from where I am presenting today, the Aboriginal people, their spirits and ancestors and acknowledge the vital contribution that Indigenous people and cultures make to this nation that we share. The Australian Stockholm Junior Water Prize is the biggest water science competition for high school students and is proudly supported by Xylem. The prize aims to challenge young people to think big and take a fresh look at local and global water problems. The winner announced today will go on to represent Australia on the international stage, competing with over 35 countries later this year. Now we received a record number of entries in 2021 and I'd like to take a moment to thank and congratulate all the young scientists that participated. It is truly inspiring to see their dedication and hard work and we'd like to commend them for producing such high quality, thoughtful solutions to water quality issues. Today you will hear from five innovative young scientists, Annabelle Strawn, Laura Redman, Diane Callis, Tim Bart and Devon O'Connell. Now the judging has all been completed prior to today. So this webinar is really about showcasing these incredible young minds. Before I introduce our first finalists, I'd like to give you a quick overview of the proceedings. Each finalist has been given eight minutes to present their project, which will be directly followed by four minutes of question time. If you do have a question, please type it in the Q&A box at any point during the finalist presentation, and then we'll come to them at the conclusion of their presentation. Following these presentations, we will have a few words from our award sponsor, Xylem's Managing Director, Oceana, Brian Krishna, and then I'll hand over to the Association's Chief Executive, Corinne Cheeseman, to announce this year's winner. I would finally like to advise that this session is being recorded and will be shared publicly with those who are unable to join us today. Time now for our first finalist presentation. I'd like to welcome Annabelle Strawn from Meriden School. Hi, Annabelle. Hello. Welcome. Now we're going to stop sharing our screen so that you can share yours. Fantastic. Whenever you're ready to get started. Hi, my name is Annabelle and I'm 16 years old. Over the past year, I have looked at lemon peel as a bioflocculant. So a challenge I identified is that many water environments have become saturated with suspended particles from erosion, agricultural and industrial runoff. This is a problem because it is detrimental to the aquatic ecosystem as the matter can deteriorate water quality. This happens through increased turbidity, altered color and the growth of toxic compounds. This also limits the amount of sunlight that can penetrate the surface and averts vital life processes such as photosynthesis from being carried out. The suspension of particles is also damaging to humans as the particles can be inorganic like clay and minerals, or organic like bacteria and algae, which provide attachments for pollutants that are hazardous to health. Additionally, turbidity can reduce the aesthetic value of a region impacting negatively on industries such as recreation and tourism, which are important for the economy. So the traditional and current way of addressing these issues is to use inorganic flocculation to retrieve the suspended particles. This essentially is using a chemical such as aluminum sulfate to bring non-settling particles together into a clump by hydrogen bonding or van der Waals force. The molecular chains of the flocculant unravel to entrap colloidal and coarse particles into flocks, which are then retrieved through sedimentation. This is the most widespread method as it is cost effective. However, it is no longer viable in a marine environment 
as it requires a significant input of chemicals, which harm the surrounding ecosystem and also human health, such as effects such as Alzheimer's disease and the numerous increased risks of cancers. So to reduce the environmental impact of turbidity in a safe, affordable and eco-friendly manner, I investigated the use of lemon peel as a bioflocculant. My aim was to determine the effect of the percentage concentration of lemon peel within the flocculant on the amount of hydrated kaolin clay particles retrieved and the turbidity removal efficiency, which is just the difference between the turbidity before and after expressed as a percentage. And with these factors, I determined the optimum concentration. The concentration of a bioflocculant is important as the mixing velocity can tear apart when flocks are when the concentration of flocks are too high. Optimal flocculation is achieved by, retrieved, by retrieving the highest amount of particles and removing the highest amount of turbidity. So why did I use lemons? Well, my initial research found that lemon peel could act as a, as a successful flocculant because of its chemical composition and bioactive compounds such as citric acids. Lemons are also anionic, which decrease their toxicity to the environment and reduce turbidity by removing fine solids through hydrophobic bridging mechanisms. The flocculant in my investigation also contained a constant amount of chitosan, which had a high molecular weight, allowing it to absorb on particles. Chitosan is a type of sugar extracted from the outer skeleton of shellfish. The use of fruit peels as a bioflocculant has been underexplored considering their vast potential to become a significant resource for industrial application. Currently, bioflocculants have not been implemented on a wide scale for wastewater treatment as they often have a low yield and a high production cost. This report combats this because both lemon peel and chitosan are waste products, which reduces production costs and because my aim is to reduce them to maximize turbidity efficiency removal through different concentrations. Both of these component, components are also biodegradable and friendly to the environment. So my methodology included using a jar test to simulate the treatment of water using a lemon peel chitosan flocculant. In total, I conducted 24 jar tests with eight different concentrations. I prepared the flocculant by drying out lemon peel, then grounding it into a powder and separating it into different masses from zero to four grams using a scale. Then two grams of chitosan was added to each lemon peel concentration. The water being tested was composed of distilled water and kaolin clay. I determined the turbidity of the water to be 1,888 NTU through the following equation. So essentially what I had to do to find out the turbidity was pour the water slowly into a turbidity tube. A turbidity tube is a thin tube with what's called a sechi disc at the bottom. So when you're pouring slowly, the moment you can't see the disc anymore because the water is too turbid, you stop pouring and measure the height in centimeters. That is then put into the equation. So with each concentration, I stirred the jar for two minutes using a drill piece and then passed the water through a sieve which collected the suspended solids. This was then measured in grams. I then calculated the turbidity using a turbidity tube and determined the efficiency removal. So what I found was that as concentration increases, the amount of kaolin retrieved increases at an increasing rate. However, there, was, there are dips in the occurring at 50% concentration, which may be attributed to the neutralization of the flocculant. So this essentially occurred when there were equal amounts of chitosan and lemon peel in the flocculant. The chitosan is cationic, whilst lemon is anionic, which meant the forces attracting submerged particles were mostly cancelled out. However, on the whole, the increasing trend is attributed to the increase in bioactive compounds present in the lemon peel, such as citric acids, as these aid the removal of solids through balancing different surface potentials and absorbing particles. Additionally, the turbidity efficiency removal found a similar trend. However, restabilization occurred above concentrations of 60%. Since the molecules became too long and increased the diffused layer, it fostered repulsion and lowered the efficiency removal of the, of the kaolin clay. So my hypothesis was confirmed as 33.3% and 60% were optimum concentrations. These results can act as an indicator of effective ratios 
With further research on a larger scale outside of a domestic environment, the bioflocculant could be implemented as a replacement of traditional alums. These concentrations could be utilized for waters with lower turbidities than 10 NTU as the turbidity efficiency removal would see the turbidity decrease to an acceptable drinking standard as by the World Health Organization. This could improve the quality of life of populations in areas which don't have access to clean water, as this often coincides with a lack of funding available and hence limitations on water filtration plants. This means that bioflocculation could provide an affordable alternative to cleansing water in the developing world and reducing rates of waterborne illnesses. Thank you. Thanks, Annabelle. Thanks so much for sharing your presentation. It's really, really interesting. Um, I did want to just, while we wait on some Q&A questions to come through, um, I had an initial question for you, which was just around, you're looking at developing countries. Had you looked at um, any countries in particular where you think that this would be an effective solution? Um, around Africa, in, specifically in Central Africa, I think it would be a great solution as populations only have access to really dirty water in the most rural parts of the country and um, in, small content, in small volumes of water, the flocculant could be used to lower it to a safer drinking standard. Fantastic. Now we have had a question come through from Jorg. So um, Jorg's question is, what is the size of the particles you were trying to remove? Um, the size of the particles, I think they were 200 um, micrometers. So it could, in a more industrial application, I could have used a smaller sieve to trap even more particles, but um, I just use one of the kitchen sieves at home. Um, and Jorg's followed on from that. And also, what about bacteria? Bacteria. Um, the water I tested was completely distilled water with just pure cowling clay. So there was no bacteria in what I tested, but I'm sure it would um, trap if in natural waters, the, they would be attracted to the cowling clay and would um, flocculate into one clump. Okay, thank you. And um, one last question. So this one's from Matt. Matt says, wow, great project, Annabelle. What do you see as the biggest challenge to scale up this solution? Um, and just part two of that question was, where is lemon production and waste greatest around the world for ease of access? Um, lemon production would, I think, mostly be concentrated in parts of Southeast Asia. Um, and also the biggest challenge to upscale this solution would be initial funding. I think it would be quite a big cost to start with the lemon peel but, um, and chitosan. But once that's overcome, I think it would be quite affordable in, on the large scale. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much. And um, yeah, we hope you get to continue exploring um, how you could scale up, scale up your project in the future. Um, so thank you very much, Annabelle. Um, so our next finalist is Laura Redman from Barker College with her project. Welcome, Laura. Hi. So we'll just stop sharing our screen and then you can share yours. Fantastic. Our natural world is an inherently complex system that works only by an incredible cohesion created by the intricate structures found within it. Global pressures and increasing human footprints put pressure on precious natural resources, none more so than water. Uh, today, many third world countries are experiencing exposure to issues related to safe drinking water, notably Kenya, which faces a widespread problem with rural water contamination. Currently, 41% of Kenyans rely on unimproved water sources and 71% use unimproved sanitation solutions, with many having to rely on unimproved, um, many having to rely on sourcing water themselves. This means that the rate of exposure to various waterborne diseases is high, as not only much of the water at the pumps and basins it is collected in is contaminated, but also the containers that they are using. Most of the objects that are used are simply any vessel that could be found, often meaning they were previously used for fertilizer, waste, or oil. Such water is then drunk almost immediately by those collecting it, with little measures in place to attempt to sanitize it. 
Additionally, the only resources available to attempt to clean any water is often only a simple boiling method. However, many people will opt to use their limited energy available for other concerns like cooking food. Thus, there exists a need for a cheap and easily implemented way to make water safe to drink. In addition to safe water supply for humans, there is huge potential for processes that can adequately sanitize water for animal enterprises and agricultural production as a threshold for safe water consumption is slightly higher. In my research, I looked at whether naturally occurring materials such as woody stems could be used to filter microbes from water. Existing research pointed to the idea that plant xylem has a significant potential as a means of filtration for biological contaminants. In 2014, a study by Boudelier et al. used a white pine species and dye as a proxy for biological contaminants. The results demonstrated flow rates of about 0.05 milliliters per second using only about a one centimeter squared filter, which corresponded to about four liters of filtration daily. The same study also found that the related rejection rate of bacteria was at least 99.9%. However, this was only in relation to looking at a species of gymnosperm that is not highly widespread globally. So my project investigated the effectiveness of the Casuarina genus, specifically two species, the Casuarina cunninghamiana and Casuarina glauca, in filtering a biological contaminant, specifically E. coli, from a sample of water. Being an angiosperm, the structure of the Casuarina vascular bundles suggests a potential for using species within the genus as biological filters for contaminated water. Casuarina cunninghamiana is a river she oak with a growth rate of about 10 centimeters per month, and application is primarily in agroforestry and used as fodder due to it being such a plentiful and easily replaceable resource. Amazingly, thanks to the weird forces of globalization, these Australian native plants have been widely distributed across the world and are relatively abundant, even in Kenya where they could be possibly used in the application of water filtration. The plant there is used as a living fencing technique around rural farms and is thus a renewable timber product due to its rapid growth. So for my experiment, I made filters using branches from the two selected casuarina species, along with PVC tubing to allow for a nutrient broth of E. coli to be passed through. E. coli is a common contaminant of drinking water with harmful strains having the potential to cause significantly adverse effects such as abdominal cramps, diarrhea, nausea, and death. Um, luckily though, for my presentation, uh, for my experiment, sorry, I used a K-12 strain of E. coli that has been genetically modified and is widely used in scientific studies and is only able to survive in cultures under very specific conditions. So that meant that there was no survival in the human gut possible, and so there was no risk in illness when undertaking my experiment. After filtering the E. coli sample fully, I inoculated petrofilm sleeves with filtrate from the samples and incubated them for 24 hours. I then observed and photographed each plate and counted the number of coliform forming units, or CFU, on each one, with the results ranging from about 0 to 25 per plate. I also conducted a t-test based on the average and standard deviations in the data collected, which demonstrated that there was not a statistically significant difference between the mean number of spots for the Casuarina glauca and Casuarina cunninghamiana trees. While the results of my experiment found that the filtrate still exceeds the World Health Organization guideline of undetectable or less than one CFU on an incubated plate, the results are still valuable as a significantly lower CFU count were found in all cases against the control of an unfiltered plate. With potential in developing countries for a biological filter to be implemented and the inability in some cases to access any other sterilization techniques, an almost 80% reduction in the prevalence of E. coli over a long span of time greatly reduces the chance of illness. Additionally, the ease at which such a filter can be created holds promise in communities where education rates create a necessity for easily understood systems. This can be seen especially in Africa where more than two in five adults are still illiterate. These results should be treated cautiously, however, because there were several limitations to my experiment. The sample size of the plates tested were relatively small and some samples experienced issues. Notably, one branch did not filter E. coli at all, which could possibly be attributed to the apparatus having some issues um, with the filtered E. coli potentially leaking through. Both of these results were treated as outliers and thus were not included in the final results. Additionally, unfortunately, the plates were only viewed 24 hours after um, the experiment took place due to involuntary COVID-19 shutdowns of the lab and could have potentially shown different or greater counts if viewed 48 hours or even later. I also employed measures to ensure that there was no cross-contamination with any other bacteria whilst conducting my experiment. The plastic tubing around the branch was placed in boiling water to sterilize it before use. Additionally, the tube and the branch used was suspended in the tube with tape placed around the outside of the plastic tube to ensure it didn't catch on the branch. 
This ensured that the branch had not come into contact with the filtrate or the tubing it was collected in to ensure that no other bacteria was introduced. The collection tube for the filtrate was also autoclaved, which meant that it was sterilized before use and a micropipette machine was used with different tips each time when moving the nutrient broth into the top of the plastic tubing and after when the filtrate was transferred from the collection tube onto the petrofilm plate. Also, all bench space and apparatus were routinely ripped with ethanol and a Bunsen flame was kept on, which created a convection shell that's, cell sorry, that can, ensured no aerial contamination. There is further research needed in creating a more practical filter out of branch samples. A major limitation with such one that I created was that the rate at which it was able to pass the sample through was quite slow, taking almost 24 hours during the experimental component of my research, and thus investigating a more accessible filter that could be implemented in a real life scenario, scenario would be the next step for this concept. However, my experiment has helped demonstrate the potentially significant ramifications in using our natural resources to tackle global water issues and improve water security around the world. By no means does this offer the solution to tackling the significance of the water crisis seen globally and the real world application of such a filter would need more research before this could be made possible. But I think what makes my research important is that it offers an immediate solution to an ongoing problem in a highly practical way. In the next few years, it is very highly likely that there is a better solution posed, but we are living in a world of limited resources that needs issues like this addressed immediately. A biological filter like this is 100% renewable, incredibly economically sound, and the mechanisms of which can be easily understood by practically any user, making it a significantly sound next step in helping to tackle global water issues. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. And yeah, you're really tackling a very important issue there. So it's really great you've been thinking about it from a sustainability angle. Now, while we wait for some questions to come through from our online audience, um, one from me is just a simple one. And I guess just what drew you to Kenya as kind of the focus for your um, project? Yeah, definitely. I think um, when I was initially researching, I sort of looked at just generally third world countries that were experiencing issues. Um, but specifically Kenya, there is a global water project that is currently ongoing there. So there has initially been quite a lot of research into what issues they are facing. So I felt like it was a really important focus for me that there was already the problem there and I had the relevant statistics and data that I was able to apply it. Um, and then when I researched further to find that the plant that I wanted to investigate was in such abundance in the country, I think it was just you know, a very natural next, next step into my research. Yeah, that's great. Fantastic. Um, we have a question from Jörg again, but it was just around, are you aware of ultraviolet light cleaning gadgets, um, which would be helping to, sorry, it's not typed very well. Uh, um, solar powered like filtering is that yeah I think just I guess are you aware of it was the question is that like so like just using a little like gadget or something to you mm. I think like obviously that's there and that's a very like um good thing that we could use but uh, first of all it's not great for the environment I think what mine sort of points towards is we're using materials that are already there and are renewable but using such this this kind of gadget is like introducing more into the environment that we don't really want to do. Um, also, we have it here and if these kind of gadgets have been created but the significance of the problem still exists, I think we do need to start looking at more realistic ways to approach the problem because I think that the ultraviolet is very good in a, you know, when we talk about it in a big sense from places like this. But when I think when we're looking at a real world application, we need something like a simple filter that people who aren't very educated and who need the resources there in their small communities can use. Yeah, fantastic, thank you. Let's see if we get any more questions through. Um, here we've got one from uh, Matt. So nice work, Laura, what would make it easier um, for entrants in this comp competition to be able to attack great projects like this in terms of support that we could offer? Um, oh, you mean like in sort of creating like a real sort of application to mine? Yeah, I guess just helping you, you know, in the competition, what we could do to improve your project and help you make it easier to do your testing. Um, well, to be honest, I did receive a lot of support throughout mine um, from my school to help me do my um, experimental project. I think for some people, if they were doing it at home, having access to a lab to sort of do it, I found with mine having 
stuff like being able to autoclave um, my things to make sure they're all sterilized and having the proper lab equipment was really important for my design to make sure that it was you know, a very sound process in every way. So I think it would be easier for entrants if they were doing their project at home to be able to have access to a lab maybe. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you. And I guess maybe in a non-COVID world, it would probably be a little bit easier. I know a lot of organisations and things weren't open late last year for um, guests to take that opportunity. So yeah, fantastic. All right. Well, thank you so much. And thank you for your presentation. Um, I'd now like to invite our next finalist, Diane Callis from Presbyterian Ladies College in Sydney. Welcome, Diane. Hi. So we'll just stop sharing our slides and then you can take over. My name is ready. My name is Dion Callis and I go to Presbyterian Ladies College, Sydney, and I'm in year 11. My research project is called The Effect of Ash on Brine Shrimp. My project was inspired by the unprecedented bushfires that took place in Australia in 2019 and 2020 due to the record-breaking temperatures and months of severe drought, which had a devastating effect on our community and the environment. Due to the record-breaking temperatures and months of severe drought prior to the catastrophe, the fires managed to burn nearly 15 million acres of land and destroyed approximately 1,400 homes. Not only did this natural disaster affect people's lives and the tourism industry, but also the environment and native animals on both land and our oceans and waterways. The effects were devastating for all Australians and many families were personally impacted, including my own. My family owns a house and cattle farm down on the New South Wales South Coast, and we were under threat there during the new year in 2020. We could see storms of flames and smoke, and it was horrible seeing kilometres of burnt, blackened bush nearby. Habitat for native animals was destroyed, including that of marine organisms. These fires stood as a threat against the ocean's ecosystem by the massive debris, ash, soot, and blackened vegetation they left behind, which collected around Australia's shorelines due to the heavy rainfall that followed. Smoke and wind also carried it to rivers, creating issues for drinking water supplies by contaminating rivers, dams, and the ocean. Bushfires burned around the Warragamba Dam catchment area in Sydney's west, which provides drinking water for 3.7 million people. Blackwater events caused by algal blooms, also called cyanobacteria, may occur due to the sudden influx of nutrients into waterways. Dangerously low levels of oxygen may also lead to more mass fish kills. Thousands of fish died along the banks of northern New South Wales rivers. These algal blooms in dams could potentially create significant problems for the water supply of major cities and kill wildlife. A positive effect of burned soils flowing into streams and rivers is the fertilisation they provide to water plants and algae by providing extra nutrients. But after being over-fertilised by ash, algae takes over and depletes available oxygen in the water. It also does this when it dies and decomposes, causing the asphyxiation of marine organisms. The high ash content is causing the fish a dramatic drop in oxygen levels and has therefore made several rivers inhabitable. Australia had never seen bushfires like this before, so the unprecedented levels of ash produced enabled me to examine the effects on aquatic life after the remains infiltrated Australia's waters. My study examines the effect ash from the bushfires has on the key marine organisms, brine shrimp, scientifically known as Artemia salina, using them as bioindicators in order to ultimately determine the severity of the bushfires on aquatic life. My experiment was carried out using a microscope to measure and observe the heart rate of the live Artemia salina by counting their leg movements for 15 seconds and then converting this data to beats per minute. The experiment was repeated three times. I borrowed my school's petri dishes, pipettes and electric ballots. I sourced an optical model SD2PL microscope through my dad's work. The batch of Norpley baby brine shrimp and reverse osmosis water was provided by a local aquarium and I sourced ash from the New South Wales South Coast. Brine shrimps move by rhythmically beating their leaf-like legs called philipodia, which are used as gills. 
Gills, a crustacean respiratory organ found in their feet, are very similar to lungs in the way that they function because oxygen molecules are pulled into the bloodstream as they pass over the gills surface. Therefore, their heart rate can be counted through their leg movements. The faster the heart rate, the quicker the legs will move as more oxygen is supplied to the body. And this allows the muscles to contract and so their legs can move. Brine shrimp are sensitive to poor water quality. So any presence of ammonia and nitrite might kill a shrimp very quickly. Therefore, reverse osmosis water, which is basically pure water was used, but it is representative of their environment for only approximately 10 to 12 hours. They are also very demanding of oxygen, but cycling them in a tank wouldn't be necessary for the purpose of my experiment because they aren't being fed and hence maintaining good water quality. The shrimp were observed in shallow petri dishes after varying the time of exposure in the range of 0 to 120 minutes and differing concentrations of ash from 0 to 0 0.5 grams per 25 mils of reverse osmosis water. The trend in the results showed that as the ash content and time of exposure is increased, the heart rate of the brine shrimp decreased. The average heart rate of the brine shrimp after exposure to 0 0.1 grams of ash for 15 minutes was 211 beats per minute, whereas for 120 minutes was 62 beats per minute with many deaths. The conclusion can be drawn that more time in the ash causes a decrease in their heart rate. Not only the time was a significant factor, but the results gathered also showed that only a small quantity of ash of 0.1 grams was enough to immensely affect the shrimp's heart rate and physical movement by causing death in a short period of time. When the ash enters the gills of the shrimp, it hinders oxygen uptake, therefore slowing the rate at which oxygen is reaching their blood system, explaining why the heart rate and leg movement ceased as more ash was added to the petri dishes and exposure time was increased, leaving more time for the ash to block their gills. This shows that ash created by the fires negatively affect aquatic organisms, specifically brine shrimp. After starting the experiment at 30 minutes, the shrimp were visibly at the edges of the petri dishes clumped. And after one hour, it was discovered that most of the shrimp were dead. Following this observation, the ash content, time components and method were modified to ensure useful results could be attained. By lowering the ash content and making time intervals shorter, it meant when the test was completed again, the brine shrimp would live and their heart rate slash leg movements could be observed. It was also difficult to see the shrimp due to the ash, so adding more shrimp would increase the chance of finding them. Some problems faced when completing the experiment for the second time where the scale balance wasn't accurate enough when measuring small values of ash. So the amount was judged by the eye at times resulting in some sampling rate errors. The ambient room temperature was another error encountered in this experiment, but it was achieved by closing the door of the bedroom after turning on a heater. It was found to be difficult to count the leg movements of the shrimp, but it was consistent as the same person observed and counted all of the shrimp. The effect of soot and ash on marine life is still not fully understood, as there could be many impacts on organisms that we are not yet aware of. Further investigation could include measuring the water quality, such as pH, turbidity, dissolved oxygen, and the presence of algae as a result of the ash. Other marine life obtained from alternate waterways could also be examined to determine if the same outcome is concluded using a similar experimental method. Additionally, the use of slow-mo video recording devices would allow more accurate measurements. The impact the bushfires had on ecosystems in our oceans and waterways remains an area which can be further investigated in collaboration with authorities such as the New South Wales Coast Watch and the Department of Planning, Industry and Environment. Thank you. Thanks, Dianne. Thanks for your presentation. A very um, topical issue for us in Australia and also globally. Um, we had had a, just a comment from one of our attendees around, um, you know, it just it being a really important issue um, and that, you know, we should be also looking at ways that we can help prevent bushfires so that we don't have these uh, problems in our waterways. Um, just while we wait for a few more questions to come through, I just thought I'd ask you about if you had any, um, I guess, thoughts or if you'd investigated the longer term effects that um, the ash might have on those waterways. Um, that would be a great idea. Um, it was very hard. They were very small and very hard to see and count. And I think that the brine shrimp wouldn't exactly be a good um, 
source or organism to do that because they were so little um, and they died so quickly. So maybe um, by using another organism, we could um, look at the effect after longer amounts of time. Yeah. And would you look at something maybe a bit bigger? Yeah, then? probably. Yeah. yeah. Um, just see if we get another question in. Oh, yeah, um, I've just had a question from the room <laughs> come in about, I guess, you know, it's a big problem in Australia that we have bushfires. Have you thought about its application um, in other countries where bushfires are prevalent? Um, I haven't really thought about that, but it, um, I think it could be useful in other countries as well. It was just, um, you know, it was a very big thing in Australia. So obviously that's where I got my um, idea from but um, I think it could be used in other countries as well yeah okay great well thank you so much for your presentation um, I think we all really enjoyed watching it as it's yeah such a um, interesting uh, phenomenon that happens so, so close to all of our hearts um, so thank you Now, last but certainly not least, I'd like to invite Tim Bard and Devon O'Connell. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Fantastic. We'll stop sharing our screen and then you can get underway. So good afternoon, Tim and Devon here. And we'd both like to thank you for this opportunity to tell you more about our science project. We are both year 10 homeschool students. We live on a farm near Inverell, New South Wales. Our project is entitled, Water, Can the Sun Solve Our Shortages? And in case you have not seen the short video intro we've made, we've included at the start of our PowerPoint, a picture of the finished product of our solar distiller. When we started this project, we were in the midst of a record-breaking drought. The years of 2018 and 2019, the worst drought in recent Australian history, and we are in the epicenter of it. Like most farms, the shortage of water forces us to sell off most of our livestock, and as the drought wore on, we could only watch as the land we had nurtured for years dried up and became a desert. Water scarcity is part of life for many Australians, and we use the second largest amount of water after the United States, as shown in the graph. However, the situation we found ourselves in prompted us to think how we might create a new source of fresh water to survive future droughts. Despite the severity of the drought, we were fortunate that our bores did not run dry, even as our rain tanks became empty. But our bore water, like most Australian groundwater, is high in calcium and other minerals and is therefore unsafe to drink and less treated. In addition, the high mineral content makes the bore water unsuitable for laundry machines and water heaters. Bore water is also less than ideal for irrigation in our vegetable gardens as the levels of calcium and other minerals are detrimental to plant health. All of these factors got us thinking. If there was a simple standalone system that did not need chemicals to purify our bore water, we could survive any drought. The first inspiration for our water distiller came when our youth counselor, Mr. McCurman, told us about a solar water boiler he had built in his youth using a parabolic mirror and a copper pipe to heat water. As shown in the video, we modified his ideas to form our own solar still. Throughout the project, we used a scientific method to order the steps of building our solar still and analyzing the data we collected. The initial step identifying a problem was easy, the drought and other subsequent other water shortages. The next step was forming an hypothesis. Unlike other water purifiers, purifiers that we seen that were either too simple or impractical or very large commercial systems. Our invention would solve the water problem by using the energy of the sun and a parabolic mirror to purify water. When building an invention, we figured that planning, building and experimentation was the most important part. So our project has emphasis on these areas. On the PowerPoint, you can see some of our preliminary designs and how they evolved into the final product. To test the viability of our hypothesis, we decided to build a prototype. 
The aim of this first test was to see how effectively we could heat water using a simple parabolic mirror and some sunlight. We constructed our first prototype out of plywood from our school's wood shop using aluminum foil for a reflective surface. We were pleased with the initial results. The chart on slide 10 shows the surface temperature of the copper pipe as it is heated by the reflector, which we recorded using a digital kitchen thermometer. In order for the distiller to be successful, we need to heat the water above 100 degrees to Celsius to create steam. But after our first trials, this seemed within our reach. With our success spurring us on, we made some final design adjustments and began working on an improved model of our distiller. With assistance from one of our dads, who works in the sign making business, we were able to utilize scrap material and even some factory machinery to build our design. Copper pipe and other necessities we found as scrap were bought with their combined al allowances. You can see the final design coming together in the photos. We then began to design the exterior features such as the condensation chamber and sun tracker, the self-leveling piping system. These features are what makes our distiller different from other distillers. Our design was simple. It was a box with a smaller box inside. The large box would fill up with cold bore water and the steam would enter the small box and condensate once cooled by the surrounding water. We would also use the outer box as a source of bore water that would enter the copper heating pipe. The level of the bore water in the heating pipe is controlled by the float valve at the head of the distiller. To keep the float valve level and effective, we made the entire copper heating pipe self-leveling using bearings and counterweights. The sun tracker is controlled by two photovoltaic cells that are attached to the frame. With the help of a small controller, we programmed it and tracked the sun to maximize the sun's energy. At this stage of the project, we ran a series of labs to collect data and test the success of our design modifications. Among other things, we tested how long it takes for the distiller to get to heat bore water to boiling temperature, how long it takes to, to make steam, and how long it takes to go through the entire water purification process. These labs show the efficiency of our distiller in the purification process, as we are averaging two to three liters an hour of, distil of distilled water, despite cold weather conditions while testing. To analyze our data, we took a sample of our raw bore water and the water purified by our distiller to have them tested. The lab results showed that in our distilled water, there is no combined chlorine, salt, or phosphates. More importantly, there is only a fraction of the amount of calcium, cyanuric acid, and alkalinity in the distilled water compared to the bore water. And the distilled water had a pH of 8, which is acceptable for household use. After reviewing the lab results, a local plumber told us that our distilled water could cause no problems in household laundry machines or hot water heaters, and it was safe for drinking. Further improvements could be made to achieve completely pure water, but this finding verified our hypothesis was correct. Building our solar distiller was a great way to learn about the scientific concepts, both in theory and in practice. We learned how to construct a functional apparatus that distilled water. Besides practical skills, the project required some high level theory too, mathematical equations involving parabolic curves and focal points, and physics concepts of pressure, temperature, and material dynamics. Had we not mastered these theoretical concepts, our distiller may not have been functional. One problem is that scaling occurred due to hard water. We solved this issue by installing an end cap on the pipe which we could remove to clean out with, vin with vinegar and a bottle brush. The possibility of bacterial growth is minimal. Many bacteria, such as Legionella have a growth period of seven to 10 days and cannot survive temperatures of over 60 degrees Celsius. This means that it cannot grow in our condensation chamber or heating pipe because of the high temperatures created by the steam and boiling water. Along the way, many amazing people such as our parents, teachers have helped us and we have learned an incredible amount from them. In conclusion, we thank everyone who helped us get this far. Ultimately, we hope that our invention can help people all over the world by providing a new source of fresh, clean water. Thank you.
Thanks, Kim and Devon. And yeah, it's a very, very impressive project that you have designed and constructed there. Certainly got some bright futures in engineering ahead of you and maybe some job offers after this webinar from some of our um, members in the industry. So thank you very much uh, for your presentation. Um, so I had a question for you, which was just around the costs that were involved um, in design and build and um, what that kind of looked like and is that a cost-effective solution? Yes, thank you, great question. So um, it cost the, about $450 to make. Um, probably the most expensive, expensive feature was the sun tracker, um, but obviously we could use more scrap materials and it could also be simplified to use uh, less, uh, more cheap materials and yeah. Yeah, fantastic. And do you think there's an opportunity to scale up the project or would you keep it as it is? Uh, yeah, you could definitely scale it up um, on a much larger scale and uh, to produce a lot more water, but you can also keep it the size for household use or independent um, homeowners. Thank you. So we've had a question come through which says this is a very cool and innovative construction. How large would you still need to be to scale this up to serve a typical household? The, the cellar in its current size is big enough for a typical household, we would say, for mainly just for drinking water. But you may need to make, make it bigger or have more than one distiller to provide for all household uses. And in terms of, um, I guess, applications for it, obviously, in Australia, and would you look at um, having it internationally as well? Yeah, so this uh, could definitely um, be deported to uh, places like Africa, uh, where water is shorted, where there's lots of water shortages, and it could be implemented in areas like that where they lack clean drinking water. Fantastic. And one final question um, from Lawrence, who says, hello, great project. How do you manage the waste stream? Does it cause fouling or do you bleed off some of the water? Um, no, the water is completely pure once it, um, once it uh, turns into steam. And so, yeah, there's no worry there. So no waste? Oh, yeah. Sorry, the waste... Um, we can remove uh, we can remove from the pipe because there's an end cap and we can uh, clean that um, waste out with vinegar and a bottle brush. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for your presentation. It's uh, certainly an amazing project. Thank you. Thank you. Now, before we announce this year's winner, I'd like to invite Brian Krishna, the Managing Director of Oceana at Xylem to say a few words as our very generous award sponsor. Thank you very much, uh, Katie, and uh, yeah, very, very uh, proud and, and honoured to be uh, sponsoring the Stockholm Junior Water uh, Prize here uh, in Australia. Xylem, uh, as a global company, we, we actually were the founding sponsor uh, back to 1997, and we've been uh, the sponsor here in Australia for 15 plus years in a great association with the Australian Water Association. Annabelle, Laura, Deanne, Tim and Devon, just absolutely fantastic work. Um, you know, the, the level of detail in your, in your research and, and the results that you've demonstrated. And also just the, the output in the presentation itself, just the, the PowerPoints and, and the way you've delivered it. You should all be extremely proud of, uh, of what you've done. And I think, uh, you know, we're in very good hands uh, in the water industry here in Australia, if that's the sort of talent that uh, we're seeing uh, demonstrated today. I wish you all the best of luck in, uh, in the upcoming decision. And uh, with that, I'll hand back to Katie. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. And thank you, Xylem, for your ongoing support and commitment to the Australian Stockholm Junior Water Prize. I'd now like to hand over to Corinne Cheeseman, Chief Executive of the Australian Water Association, to announce the 2021 winner. Thanks very much, Katie. And what a brilliant set of projects we just heard about um, from our finalists. The calibre and the standard um, of the research 
the topics and the problems that they chose to solve, and also the application in um, developing countries, while thinking about things like sustainability and what would work in those um, conditions are all part of what makes um, this, the Australian Stockholm Junior Water Prize and the international competition such a great um, pro, uh, co competition that um, students can put projects into. So it's really great to see, um, and I'm actually quite inspired by some of the things that um, the students spoke about today. So congratulations to you all on becoming finalists and you should be very proud. And I hope that you were inspired to continue um, researching um, your creative thinking and applying science and indeed um, engineering in some of those solutions that we saw today in the future and that one day you might even decide to join the wonderful water industry that, that we work in. So I guess I'd just like to um, now go on to announcing the winner. So without further ado, I'd like to announce that the 2021 Australian Junior Stockholm Water Prize winner is Annabelle Strawn from Meriden School. Congratulations, Annabelle. What a fantastic project. And the judges had a very tough um, decision to make, and um, but you're very deserved of this prize. So Annabelle, we will be presenting this prize in person to you um, on the Tuesday the 4th of May at our Oswater Gala dinner in Adelaide. Um, so I look forward to meeting you there and um, being able to present this award to you in person um, in Adelaide soon. So um, as Katie also mentioned, this is part of the, the international award, the Stockholm Junior Water Prize. So Annabelle will now go on to represent Australia on the international stage and compete with other 35 other countries um, this year. So the international competition will be held online um, format again this year, but we are going to look at supporting Annabelle um, domestically and providing some professional development opportunities in Australia over the next 12 months um, to give Annabelle that opportunity and exposure. So now I'd like to um, ask Annabelle if you'd like to say a few words. Hello, um, I'd just like to say a big thank you for this opportunity. I've really enjoyed every step of it. So thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Excellent. Look forward to seeing you in person soon, Annabelle. Thanks, Katie. Thank you, Corinne, and congratulations, Annabelle. I'd like to also say a final thank you to our finalists today. You've each got bright futures ahead of you, and we look forward to hearing more from you soon. I'd also like to thank your teachers and schools and your families, as we know the hard work and effort that each of you contribute to these students' lives. I'd like to thank our judging panel who um, have done an incredible job to review all the award entries that we received. So our judging panel was Jeremy Lucas, Jodie Ann Dorr, Philip Rakeley and Stuart Kahn. So thank you very much to our judging panel. Um, thank you also to our sponsor, Xylem, and to each of you, our audience, for joining today's webinar. We hope you enjoyed it. And if you'd like to find out anything more about our finalists or the award itself, uh, please feel free to contact me. Thank you.